So uh, next up is uh, lecture six on differential kinematics. And I'm using some of the slides from uh, Professor Khatib here as well. Some of the guiding uh, questions for the unit are these. Uh, in manipulations, uh, not only the positions, right? Uh, as we discussed earlier, the forward kinematics. Uh, we also need to know the speeds, how fast the end effect is moving, right? With respect to the world coordinate frame or the base coordinate frame. Uh, so that is why we have differential kinematics also, position kinematics, differential kinematics. In fact, in robot controls, what we actually do is velocity control, right? When you control the velocity, you control the position as well. You can move the manipulator from one point to another by controlling these joint angles and by actually controlling their velocities, okay? Sometimes you can actually go one level up and say that acceleration control. So when you control the acceleration, you change the velocity and you change the position as well, right? Okay, so there are various, various levels that you can have your controls, but if you look at just position, uh, you cannot change the position without changing the velocity, okay? So it goes like that. Uh, eventually, the motions are actually coming from the, the current that is drawn in the joint actuators, right, joint motors. So eventually, you control the current to produce a torque, all right? The torque produces the acceleration. Acceleration changes the velocity. Velocity changes the position. So that is how it is connected to. But here, what we try to do is to get the velocity re relationship, right? What is the velocity of the end effector that you can see? It is moving like that. Velocity is changing, x dot, y dot, z dot. And as a, it is actually as a result of joint velocities, joint one, joint two, joint three, joint four. They are also uh, uh, changing their velocities, right? When the joint velocities change, the end effector velocity change. So we are going to look at that relationship. All right. So the second bullet over here is how, uh, how can the velocity of the end effector be calculated? Have you thought of, thought of that? Whether you can calculate the end effector velocity if you know the joint velocities. This is very important, right? In controls. And then third point, in order to move the end effector in a specified direction with a specified speed, say for example, welding operation, move from one direction, along one direction, X, Y, whatever, with a certain speed, it is necessary to coordinate the speeds of the individual joints. So it's not arbitrary velocity control, it's a coordinated motion of all of the joints, right? So even though the end effector is moving uniform speed, doesn't mean that joint angles are also moving uniform speed. It can be very nonlinear, complicated speed control. Okay. Uh, so finally, uh, last bullet over here, we derive the differential relationship. That is a differential relation speeds. Okay, between the joint displacements and the end effector location, end effector deflection. Let's see how we can do that. In fact, it's a bit easier than you would think otherwise. <clears throat> now, let's look at this uh, little diagram from Professor Kati. Um, you have the zero frame here and the nth frame there at the end. And for a while, you might think, oh, th this is a mistake in drawing this diagram. Well, it is not. It is, a, it is how Professor Kati has presented the deflection, right? This is the manipulator uh, deflected by a little bit. You can see a very small deflection in the joints uh, leading to uh, another very small deflection of the end effector, all right? Um, let us call it nth frame, okay? So if it's an end-link manipulator, this is the end of the manipulator, right? 
uh, if you think of another coordinate frame like tools and the point or whatever you can put that as well so let's call it n plus one it doesn't matter i don't worry about this numbering so this is the point of interest usually the tool center point okay and earlier in the forward kinematics we we saw how uh, how joint angles this theta is actually a vector of joint angles all of the joints right rotary and prismatic together is a vector and then uh, this vector through a certain nonlinear set of equations uh, uh, transform to x x is the uh, cartesian uh, position and orientation right so it has x, y, z, and also orientation in some form. So orientation representation also we looked at uh, that earlier. Right? You can have roll PGO, three angles, or you can have the, the three by three rotation matrix, okay, direction cosine matrix with three columns representing the three axes of the last frame, okay, with respect to the first frame. And we have seen these equations earlier, right? Forward kinematic equations. Now, <clears throat> what is instantaneous kinematics? Well, it is this. When you are at a certain theta, that is arm configuration, you're holding a certain posture in the Cartesian space. And if you deflect the joint configuration by a little bit, delta theta, you are actually deflecting the end effector Cartesian posture by a little amount, delta x. Now we want to combine these two together, delta theta to delta x. So theta to x is forward kinematics, delta theta to delta x is the instantaneous, instantaneous or differential kinematics. Okay? But they are very strongly related. If you know the forward kinematics, you can derive the differential kinematics, right? So their theta dot is actually linear velocity, uh, angular velocity, x dot is the linear velocity. Now this set of equations will explain you the process. Now look at this first equation over here, x equals some functional of Q, right? The Q is actually the joint angles, right? It is actually theta, but uh, as we discussed earlier, Q is the homogeneous or generalized coordinate. Q can take theta or D depending on the nature of the joint. Okay, if it is a rotary joint, it's theta. If it's a prismatic joint, it's D. So the, the common variable for joints is Q. So when you expand this uh, uh, very abbreviated equation, x becomes x1, x2 up to xm. How many Cartesian coordinates you need to specify the position and orientation, okay? But on the other side of the, uh, the equation is set of equations, all functions of Q, okay, in general. So they're different functions, f1, f2, f3, up to fm, right? Now, this is a multivariable calculus problem now. So if you differentiate, see the first one over here, x1 equals f1q, right? This is probably how the x coordinate of a manipulator written using trigonometric functions, sines and cosines uh, of the joint angles, right? So you get this equation f1q. And now you differentiate it with respect to each and every joint angle, right? You get this one. Delta x1 is defined as partial of f1 with respect to q1 times delta q1. Partial of f1 with respect to q2 right, times delta q2 and so on. Right, this is what you have learned in the previous math courses, right? In right. multivariable function, how do you calculate the differential or a small chain? It is by using the partial derivatives of the function with respect to each and every variable times there are small deflections, okay? All right. So you can do it for 
x1, x2, x3, up to all these x coordinates in the Cartesian space. Okay, x, y, z, and joint angles, everything, uh, orientation angles. Then you get this set of equations. And if you look at all these equations on the right hand side, the first element is something times delta q1. Second element is something times delta q2 and so on. This is common to every equation. So that you can get this common vector delta q1, delta q2, delta q3 like that, like this. Assemble them into one single vector delta q. And on the left hand side, delta x1, delta x2, all of these delta x's combined together as one single vector delta x. When you do that, in between you get this matrix, which is the matrix of partial derivatives of the functional with respect to each and every joint variable. So that is what is called the Jacobian, right? On the left hand side, small deflection in Cartesian space. On the far right, small deflection in the joint angles, delta Q. Okay? So the matrix is given a name, Jacobian, we call it represented by J. It's M times N in, in size, right? And depend, so if M is number of Cartesian space variables and n is number of degrees of freedom of the manipulator. And it is a function of q. q means a joint configuration. Okay. Now, you can have various configurations, right? So it depends on the configuration. When the arm is like that, is one Jacobian. When it's like that, is a different Jacobian, right? So it depends on the configuration. Now, <clears throat> you have a very nice equation over here. Now, what you want to do is uh, to, to divide both sides by delta t. This small deflection happens in within a very small time, delta t. Right? And this one also the same. A very small joint deflection within a certain small time period, right? delta t. So, when you divide by delta t and take delta t goes to zero, the limit uh, delta x by delta t is x dot and delta q by delta t is q dot. Okay, rate of change, first derivative. And in between, you have the jackpot. So this is a very elegant uh, relationship between joint speeds and Cartesian speeds, all right? So if you know the joint speed at a certain configuration, right, you can calculate the end effector speed and vice versa. If you bring the Jacobian to the other hand, other side, it will be Jacobian inverse, so now if you know x dot y dot z dot and any orientation rate, okay, you can resolve that into the joint speeds. What is the speed for joint one, joint or joint three like that? All what you need is Jacobian inverse. Is that clear up to that point? Any questions, please? Good then. Is everything clear? I hope so. So let's do a little exercise over here, right? Please take a piece of paper and you can see a manipulator on screen. It's a very simple planner manipulator. You can see two links, okay, and two joints and parallel is at axis. Uh, <clears throat> What I want you to do is, number one, derive forward kinematics of the manipulator. 
Very simple, you can write the equation for X and Y and also the orientation of the manipulator and point. Number two, derive the differential kinematics and Jacobian of the manipulator. Can you do that? <clears throat> Please uh, sketch this, right? On your paper. And I'm going to leave with you with this equation so that you can get guided yourself with these equations, right? And find the answers. Sketch this one first. Two links, theta one and theta two. Make sure theta one is with respect to this horizontal axis and theta two is with respect to x one previous uh, x axis. Okay. And this is the end point, x e y e. And the total angle or the orientation of the end effector is this way, which is theta one plus theta two. Okay. Give it a try. I'll give you about uh, three minutes to find that answer. So let me show you the answers. Before that, can you share your screen and show me your answers? Please? Raise your hands, please, uh, those who have been able to construct some answers. If any, no one. All right, in that case, uh, I'll show you uh, the answers. <clears throat> right, so this is the manipulator. This is the forward kinematics. So anybody can write this forward kinematics. So I wonder why you were not able to do even this little few equations, right? X is this point, L1 cos theta 1 plus L2 cos theta 1 plus theta 2. And Y is the height. It is sine theta 1, L2 sine theta 1 plus theta 2. And phi or psi is the orientation where the the end point, the end effect is looking at as an angle in a planar manipulator. It is a, it is this angle from the x-axis. So it is theta one plus theta two. This is not new equations. Even though it, it was a new set of equations, you you should have been able to write it yourself at this level. Uh, you have seen this before in previous forward kinematics equations. We wrote these equations, right? So it looks like we have already forgotten almost everything. So that's not good news at all. Right. So we start the discussion with the forward kinematics. And now what we do is, as you saw, I left this screen for you to use. Now all what you need to do is differentiate these equations partially, right? Like that. So what is delta x e well it is a multivariable function right? it depends on theta 1 and theta 2 so therefore let's differentiate with respect to theta 1 first times delta theta 1 then add to it differentiation with respect to delta theta 2 multiplied by delta theta 2 right this is multivariable calculus similarly for y y also depends on theta 1 and theta 2 depends on two variables. So you differentiate the function for y with respect to theta 1 first, multiplied by delta theta 1, then theta 2 next, multiplied by delta theta 2. And orientation, psi depends on theta 1, theta 2. So you differentiate with respect to theta 1 and with respect to theta 2. So uh, the differentiation is just 1 here. So you just put it 1. One. All right, so when you assemble on the left-hand side, delta x1, sorry, delta x, delta y, and delta psi, this is your delta x, how the end effector posture in Cartesian space, 
right? It is changing as a rate, not as a as a rate, as a differential, small deflection, okay? As a result of a small deflection of the joint angles, the two joint angles, delta theta one and delta theta two. Now you can clearly see that on the right hand side, the first elements are all delta theta one, delta theta one, delta theta one, right? And the second elements are delta theta twos. So you can remove them from the equation separately and make a matrix multiplication here, in which the matrix is partial derivatives of these functions with respect to individual joint variables. So delta x, double x, double theta one, or partial x, partial theta two, like that. And this is what is called the Jacobian matrix. Okay. Now, if you look at the partial derivatives, right, you can actually, once you have the forward kinematics over here, differentiate with respect to theta one, right, and then theta two, that is x, and then take y coordinate, differentiate with respect to theta one and then theta two, then take psi, differentiate with respect to theta one, then you get one over here, differentiate with respect to theta two, you get one over there, right? The, that's why these two ones are there, right? Okay. So the Jacobian would look like this. Once you get the partial derivatives of this one, right? Say, for example, what is the partial derivative of this one with respect to theta one? So it is L1 minus sine theta one plus L2 minus sine uh, theta one plus theta two is the partial derivative, right? So you, you get here like that, right? And this is the partial derivative with respect to theta two. So if you go back and see your forward kinematics equation for x, differentiate with respect to theta two, and this goes off, this would be L2 uh, sine theta one plus theta two, okay? And it's minus. So that's what you get over here. So it's simple partial differentiation, and that gives you the Jacobian. And remember, the Jacobian is function of theta one and theta two eventually, right? So right hand side, what you see is theta one and theta two. And in this particular case, you can see the first element over here is minus y, y coordinate. And the second element is x coordinate. Now, this is just a coincidence, right? In this particular case, it's x and y, but that's not very important here. Uh, what is important is that to know it is a function of uh, joint uh, configuration. So it's a configuration dependent matrix. So when you have, let's say, in multiple configuration, right? Earlier you saw the redundant manipulators where you have the same end effector position and orientation, but different configuration, elbow up or elbow down like that, right? So now if you look at the Jacobian, you have a one Jacobian for elbow up and another Jacobian for elbow down. They're different. So therefore, the Jacobian, the moment you specify it, you specify the configuration. So therefore, it is specific to the, to the configuration. Now, <clears throat> we want to see the physics. What is Jacobian? So what is it? So we know now it is matrix of partial derivatives. Uh, right uh, of the the forward kinematics with respect to joint angles. Right, fine, mathematically speaking, yes. But uh, there's more intuition into the Jacobian, right? As you see over here. So in in this particular two link manipulator, right, uh, the Jacobian can be um, identified as columns. The first column and the second column, right? As you see over here. This is the first column, this is the second column. So the first column elements are multiplied by uh, 
multiplied by uh, Q1 dot, the joint angle rate, okay, of the first joint. And the second column elements are multiplied by the second angle rate, okay, like, and so on. So that is how the matrix multiplied, right? First column elements, second column elements, and so on. And then one, you can multiply, you can actually explore or break it up into these different, different columns, first column, second, and so on, multiplied by the first joint, second joint, third joint, and so on, their velocities, and combine these together. So multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, right? So you can do this for all of the variables in Cartesian space, X, Y, Z, and angle, okay? So once you do that, you get this equation. In this particular example, tooling, you have x dot, y dot, and phi dot here. So earlier it was psi, now it is phi, sorry about that. So this, this phi here is actually psi earlier, it's a rate of change of the heading, the orientation. So uh, in the Jacobian side, right, uh, you can have J1 as a three element column times Q1 dot and plus three element column that is J2 times Q2 dot. Now in this configuration, right, we learn a lot of things. We learn a lot of things. Uh, the most important thing is this shows us how individual joint, say Q1, Q2, Q3, like that, actually they are rate, right? The speed of individual joints contribute to the end effect motion, x dot, y dot, and phi dot. Now let's take the first element, for example, this one. I forget about this one. Let's say second joint is not moving, it's, it's locked. So that the, uh, Q dot two or Q two dot is zero. In that case, you don't have a second element. Second element is zero. So you got only the first element, right? So it says a, a column times Q one dot. So this is how the first joint rate, right, control the end effector speed. So it, it, it can, maybe there's a more, there's more contribution on X dot than onto Y dot. So in that case, the end effector moves more towards X direction than along Y direction, like that. Entirely as a result of joint one speed. Now on the other hand, if you just lock joint one, it, it cannot move. So Q1 dot is zero, but you have some speed in joint two. So Q2 dot is not zero. In that case, this uh, second element or second column of the Jacobian, if you have these numbers, it tells you how this joint velocity Q2 dot affects X dot, Y dot, and Psi dot or Phi dot. So, this tells you individual joint rates, okay? How individual joint rates control the end effector speed. And after combining all these things, you get the net of resultant end effector speed. So this is a very, very important thing. The physical relationship between joints and end effector position. So if you look at the end effector speed, let's say along x direction, that is x dot, it is contributed by all of the joints in the manipulator, joint one to joint n, right? And uh, the column of the Jacobian, right? Same as the joint, that particular joint. If the joint is three, it's the third column. If the joint is four, it's the fourth column. Look at this, the column elements and you can figure out if the elements are big, it means there's a significant contribution. 
if the uh, element is small, a very small contribution from that joint to that particular Cartesian coordinate x, let's say, and so on. So this is a wealth of knowledge that we generate through Jacobian here. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions, please? So now we uh, mm, we know that how individual joint and the velocities contribute to x dot y dot z dot and the uh, uh, orientation of the end effector. Okay, All right. So my second assignment to you in the course is this, and it will be uploaded uh, not today, maybe a little later. And uh, the, the deadline for this is after two weeks, right? Because you will get a get your first assignment with the deadline next class, next Sunday, and uh, this assignment uh, the following week, all right? So what is it? It's the same manipulator. You can see it over here, right? Uh, you start at time zero, the, uh, zero seconds, right? Uh, zero, zero, so all, all these two angles, Zero, zero, right? Uh, and uh, five seconds, 45, 90. So first angle is 45, second angle is 90, right? And then uh, 10 seconds, 90, zero. So this angle would be 90, and this angle would be zero. So it's a vertical position. So it goes from horizontal position to vertical position with some intermediate point, okay? Now, uh, it's a 10 second motion and L1 and L2 are given 10 centimeters and 8 centimeters each, right? Um, well, yeah, 10 and 8, yes. So uh, you are supposed to write a MATLAB M file to draw the end effector speed in X and Y directions through this motion segment, right? I can give you some hints you write down your forward kinematics for a general point and then get the Jacobian, right? By differentiating it, you have, you already have it. And then using the Jacobian, you can calculate X dot and Y dot, right? And also the angle, uh, rate of the angle, right? Orientation. Uh, at any point, if you know the joint speed, joint one, joint two speed, right? So you are free to have some sort of speed in the joints. Look at the uh, the points here at zero seconds, five seconds, and 10 seconds. Let's look at from zero to five seconds, right? Um, in this five second period, right? The joint one changes from zero to 45. Join two changes from zero to 90. So then you can have linear interpolation in between, right? And figure out what is the that velocity, right? If you drive the, the first joint and the second joint with linear speed from say zero seconds to five seconds, right? That is your theta one dot and theta two dot within the first segment. And then comes the second segment, five seconds to 10 seconds. Again, you see, First joint changes from 45 to 90 degrees, second one 90 to zero. You can calculate the average speed. So which is the joint rate in, in that segment, latter half of the segment, right? It's, it's a constant uh, joint speed. Uh, then you can actually start the process, uh, starting with time zero, your position, joint angle, and the Cartesian position, and then you drive the manipulator with the uniform speed that you have calculated, right? And each point on the way, you can split the time into say 50 milliseconds and in MATLAB, you can calculate in 50 milliseconds how much the angle changes, joint one, joint two. 
and you can update your Jacobian to the new position and also your velocity. You already know it's a uniform velocity in the first half and also in the second half, but the uniform velocities are not the same in the first and second halves. So it's an easy assignment, but very important assignment. Okay, right. Anyway, I will write it down as a formal assignment and upload to the Moodle. You can download and work it out. Right. <clears throat> if you remember, some time back we discussed about singularities in robo robotic manipulators, and we you figured out singularity as a uh, as a configuration of the manipulator where you lose some of the degrees of freedom. It's like you're paralyzed in that configuration. You don't have the same mobility, right? Uh, when you are in that particular configuration. So we call these configurations singular configurations, right? A manipulator can have more than one singular uh, configurations. Now, before we get to that discussion, uh, I want you to look at this diagram over here, right? It's the very simple two-link manipulator uh, in a certain configuration. And now in this configuration, if you... If you look at this equation, x dot is equal to j1q1 dot plus j2q2 dot, right? We now know that. Now, if I set uh, q2 dot to zero, right, this, this one, q2 dot to zero, the second joint is locked, it's not moving. So therefore, we can remove that part from the equation. And we, we are left with only this equation, j1, Q1 dot. So now if you drive uh, joint one with the speed, right? What, what do you see happening? The end effector will move along the direction of J1. So J1 is a vector. It's, it's a column vector. It tells you a direction, particular direction where the end effector is moving, right? As a result of uh, speed in that joint angle in this particular case q1 okay first joint so physically you can you can figure that out so if joint one this one rotates right if you rotate the joint one end point will go like that with this uh, line as a as a normal line to the speed right speed vector so j1 Direction would be uh, the the motion, direction of motion. Now, now let's assume you uh, lock joint one. Now, joint one is not moving, but you only move joint two. So around this point where I have the laser pointer located now, at that point you control joint two. So you get Q two dot. But Q1 dot is zero, right? So we only actuate one joint at a time. All the other joints are locked. So when you actuate joint two only, obviously the direction of motion is like an arc, right? Uh, with the moving joint as the reference point, the arm moves like that. So therefore you can figure out J2 direction, this one. So you have two velocity vectors, J1, J2. So J1 is the Cartesian speed vector for a unit joint speed of a particular joint, joint one, joint two, joint three, like that. So the column vectors of the Jacobian are actually speed vectors in the Cartesian space, right? The speed vector in the Cartesian space with respect to a unit speed in the joint space, right? Joint space of that joint, joint one, joint two, joint three, like that. So you can clearly see J1 is the vector, velocity vector of the end effector as a result of uh, Q1 dot, and J2 is the velocity vector of the end effector, right? With respect to Q2 dot. 
Now, in this particular configuration, it's a very nice configuration, right? Uh, J1 and J2 are not aligned. They are looking at different directions. Now, if you, if you change the direction of motion of joint one, immediately J1 will reverse in that direction. It goes the other way. And if you uh, change the direction of motion of uh, joint two, immediately J2 will be going in the other direction, opposite direction. And if you actuate joint one at faster rate, and J1 will be longer vector, right? And if you reduce the speed of joint two, right? J2 will also be reduced. So you have the full control of J1 and J2. You can make it a longer vector or shorter vector or complete opposite direction. So by combining this direction, positive, negative, and the size big or small, you can combine J1, J2, right? So that the resultant of J1 and J2 would be anywhere in the workspace, up, down, left, right, or any other direction, and uh, any speed as well. You have the complete ability to move the end effector in any direction with any speed in this kind of configuration. Okay? There are no restrictions for motion. That is a point we need to uh, understand. When the robot is at, at this particular configuration, because I'm going to show you something uh, very different in a moment. Look at this configuration. When the robot arm is fully uh, stretched, okay, and fully flexed, right, completely fold back. These are awkward positions, right? These are awkward positions. In fact, we call them singular configurations, right? Why? When you fully extend your arm, right? And then control joint one, your end effector is moving in that direction, J1 direction. And now if you lock the first joint and move the second joint, in the same configuration, you get your J2 also in the same direction. When the arm is fully stretched, this is what happens. Both of these vectors are aligned in the same direction. So, you can only move the manipulator in that direction. So let's say you move the other way. So, you change the direction of motion of J1. And immediately, this arrow will be looking at the other side, opposite direction. And same is true for joint two. If you change the direction of motion of joint two, this J2 vector will be looking at the opposite direction. So it is either this way or that way. You cannot move in and out or any other direction for that matter. You can only move along that direction where you have you see J1 and J2 are right now or exact opposite direction. You don't have the full freedom, right? It's like driving on a one-way lane versus driving in an open field. In an open field, you can drive anywhere, any direction. But on a one-way road, you can only drive in that direction. Or oh, I, I can't say one way, two way. So you can go the other way as well. But anyway, it's either this way or that way, opposite, exact opposite direction. So your mobility is restricted in singular configurations. Here is another singular configuration where the arm is fully flexed, right? Folded back. In that configuration, also, right, if you move joint one or joint two, right, your end effector will be moving in one of these directions as marked as, as J1 and J2 in these arrows. So looking at the Jacobian, we can figure out, are we in a close vicinity of a, of a singularity, right? That's a simple technique. That's why this is very important. The Jacobian is so important. 
Otherwise, you would have to look at it and figure out physically whether it is a singular or near singular or whatever. So for that, we will uh, look at the Jacobin we already received. Remember this matrix for two by two Jacobin matrix. So in, in at singular configurations, so let us take one singular configuration, right? What do you pick up? Uh, say theta, J2 theta. So J2 theta means this configuration. When theta 2 is zero, it is fully stretched arm, fully extended. Now substitute theta 2 equals zero to this equation, this matrix rather. When theta 2 equals zero, right, this matrix will convert into this format. Right now, if you look at the first column and the second column, look at the first coin. It is L1 plus L2 sine theta 1. And then over here, L1 plus L2 cos theta 1. So L1, L2 sine theta 1, L1 plus L2 cos theta 1. Look at the second column. Minus L2 sine theta 1, L2 cos theta 1. Can you see the similarity? These two column vectors are looking at the same direction. Right? That's this configuration. J1 and J2 are looking at the same direction. What about the other configuration where theta 2 is 180 degrees? It's completely folded back 180 degrees. Then you get this equation minus L1 plus L2 sine theta 1, L1 minus L2 cos theta 1, right? This is the first column. And the second column, L2 sine theta 1 minus L2 cos theta 1. There also you can see sine theta 1 cos theta 1, sine theta 1 cos theta 1. So the same direction can be opposite direction because the signs. So, Clearly, the Jacobian has um, information about the singularity or singular nature of the manipulator, right? The configuration dependent uh, thing, right? Um, uh, in the Jacobian, if you look at the set of columns, there should be a way around to find out whether we are closer to a uh, or in the close vicinity of a singularity. So let's find that out. How do we have, a, say, elegant mathematical description, right, straight away from the Jacobian, so that when we do that mathematical operation, we know whether we are in the close vicinity of a singular configuration. So for that, what we do is we take the, the, the determinant of the Jacobian. Okay. So there are some activities. Okay, singular arm configuration. Uh, And the momentary, uh, okay, first question is, uh, uh, can you explain the singular arm configuration part again? Yeah, okay, I can do that. So singular arm configuration is, uh, is here. So look at the first one, singular configuration A is the singular configuration B. So in these configurations, either it is fully stretched arm or fully folded back arm, your mobility is restricted. So wherever your mobility is restricted by the configuration, we call it a singularity. We call it a singular configuration in this particular case. Okay. But if you look at the non-singular configuration right over here, you have the full freedom to move wherever you want. It's the freedom to move in the x direction, y direction, or z direction, as you wish. 
in, in singular configuration, you can move, but in one direction, right? Now, when, when you fully stretch your arm, to move like in and out is, is difficult, right? You can't do that. So that is singularity. The second question is, uh, on the momentary center of rotation in these configurations different for J1 and J2. Momentary center of rotation. Well, yeah, so the first joint, if you look at the first joint, it rotates around this point. Second joint rotates around this point. They are different. But in this configuration, the resulting end effect motion is for J1 is like that, for J2 it's also like that. That's that's my point. It's like when you have the arm fully extended, if you move the shoulder joint, you see the end effector is moving in a certain direction. But if you if you lock the, your shoulder joint and try to move the elbow, you still get the same direction of motion for the end effector. So it happens only in this configuration when the arm is fully stretched or fully folded back. Uh, the third question is uh, in same direction of movement, a different movements. I'm not very sure about that part. Uh, if you can uh, unmute and speak, uh, I can understand your second part of the question. Yes, that's actually what I asked for. That's the same sound. Now in this particular configuration, yeah. change, uh, J, I mean, J1, J2 joint uh, movements are going to be like, it's not in the same duration of movement, but isn't the path somewhat different? If you like, uh, consider that as an arc, is the radius of the arc the same? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Arc is different. Radius of arc is different. If you move joint one, it's a big radius and yeah. a big, big arc. But if you look at the second joint, when you try to rotate, it's a small radius and small arc. But if you look at the long arc, big arc and small arc, and when where they touch each other, draw a tangent. That tangent but that you draw for the small arc and for the big arc, is the the two tangents are on top of each other. Can you see that point? Yes. Yeah. Even though it's a very small arc or very big arc, the tangent is the same. We are talking about that moment. Uh, uh -huh. After a little, little while, it is totally different. Okay? So we are talking about this particular configuration at that, that moment of time. Okay. And, yeah, if you keep moving after maybe a few milliseconds, it's not a singularity. It's a different point. And if you let it go for some time, it will be like that, right? And it is, it's not a singularity. It's a, it's a perfectly good positioning so that you can move the end effector uh, as you wish. Okay? All right. So a small thing. So in that yeah. case, if, if it's only for a momentary time, then the singular con uh, configuration is like uh, like sort of hindering the robust motion. Why is that uh, huge issue when it comes to it? Because um, you will see when you do this assignment why that uh, is a big problem, right? So even though it's a very small point, right? It's just one configuration and just before or after that, it's not a singularity. Yes, that is by definition. But this is more than being a single out configuration. Um, when you are in the vicinity of a singularity, you feel the difficulty. So at the singularity, you completely lose your one or few degrees of freedom. But as you approach the singularity, you feel the difficulty gradually. Okay, so therefore, there's a certain area around the singularity where even though you can have mobility, 
but you will feel some of the joints are not moving as fast as you wish. Not some of the joints as move as fast as you wish, right? That motion is not transferring to Cartesian speed uh, as effectively as it was, right? That is the problem. So you, your joints are moving, but these joints are not producing enough motion in the XYZ, in the Cartesian space. So that is the symptom of uh, being in the closer vicinity of a singularity. Right at the singularity, you completely lose uh, the mobility. Uh, mobility in the sense one or two joints, maybe joint one, maybe joint two, right? It's not going to affect the position. Uh, no matter how 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 you uh, how fast you drive the joint. So if you look at this second configuration, here, you can see right um, now. If you move joint one, right? If you move joint one, uh, what is the motion of this point in the Cartesian space? Very small, right? Very small motion. Because it's only this much radius and you can, you can move this very fast, this joint, but because it is folded back, end point moves just a little bit. Now suppose in this configuration we have the joint uh, link one and link two same length. So which means this black dot is actually over here now. Okay, the end point is not here but here on top of uh, 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 the base link, uh, base joint, right? So in that, if that is the case, you can drive your joint one at any speed, any big speed, but still the end point is not moving. It's only the orientation changing, but position is not changing. So this is a serious loss of mobility in the Cartesian space. Even though in the joint space you are moving, your manipulator joints are moving, but end effector is not moving. So this is the problem. Did you get that point? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Sir. All right. So uh, uh, the Jacobian matrix, right, in uh, two different configurations, theta 2 equals 0, theta 2 equals 180. When you substitute <clears throat> theta 2, 0, and theta 2, 180 to this equation, you, you get this one. Now, you can understand uh, if you look at the first column and the second column, they are looking at the same direction or opposite direction. Okay, in the second case, it's opposite direction. In the first case, it's same direction. Look at the columns, same configuration. Right, this is a vector. This is also a vector, x coordinate, y coordinate, the same direction. So these vectors line up. Is the uh, uh, the symptom, right, that uh, tells you that you are getting closer to a singularity or you are uh, hovering around a singularity, okay? Now, if you look at this in a different way, so how can we uh, develop a mathematical um, technique to uh, to implement in our robotic systems, computers, where it, it computes the Jacobian and then whatever additional equations and tell us instantaneously, you are this much close to a singularity, right? So I think it's extremely important, right? Because there can be singularities in uh, within the configuration, within the workspace as well, okay? So uh, if you, work out the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, right? Uh, for this one is a two by two. The determinant would be like that. I'm not going to take you through math. You know how to work out uh, the de determinant of a square matrix. And in this particular case, it would eventually be 
L1, L2, sin theta 2. L1, L2, sin theta 2. That is the Jacobian. Uh, the determinant of the Jacobian. Now, if you substitute theta 2 equals 0, 480, we know that these two are the singularities already. We know that. But if you substitute these numbers to the determinant, determinant will be 0. Now, we find the technique. Okay. Now, when the Jacobian determinant is 0, uh, your robot manipulator is in a singular configuration. And if the determinant of the Jacobian is nearly zero, you can safely say my manipulator is hovering around a, a singularity. So therefore, you can, you can have a threshold or something. And uh, when you go to that threshold, right, like near zero, right, um, you can set an alarm saying that uh, you're too close to a singularity. So that operation can be halted and you can plan your trajectory in a different way, not going into that, that particular point where you have this singularity. So it's very simple, mathematically, very easily integratable to any system. All what you need to do is uh, looking at the arm configuration, read all the joint angles and put it put that into the Jacobian and calculate the uh, uh, the determinant all right and if it is closer to zero not good uh, closing in uh, a singularity all right any questions about that Is everything clear? Good. Yes. Right, we'll move on. Let's talk about the inverse kinematics of the differential motion, right? So inverse of the differential kinematics is where you use the end defector speed, that is x dot, y dot, z dot, or any other orientation rate of the end defector. And calculate your joint speeds. What is the re re required joint one speed, joint two speed, joint three speed, and so on. So in, in math, what you need to do is to uh, get this equation, the, the previous equation of forward differential kinematics, x dot equals j times q dot, and then multiply both sides with Jacobian inverse. And when you do that, right-hand side will be just q dot, and the left-hand side would be Jacobian inverse x dot. Pretty easy, pretty easy. So if you know your end defector speed, that is x dot, you can calculate q dot. But there's a condition to be satisfied. What is that condition? If you are to use this equation, there's a condition to be satisfied. What is that? The Jacobian inverse must exist. Jacobian inverse must exist. Jacobian inverse comes from the cofactor matrix divided by Jacobian determinant. Now you know the Jacobian determinant is zero at a singularity. So when you are at a singularity, Jacobian determinant is zero, therefore Jacobian inverse does not exist. Very clear. So you cannot use this equation, inverse equation, when you are at a singularity. That is another reason why you should avoid being at singularity if you want to use Jacobian inverse. Right? 
if you ever use Jacobin inverse in your control system or motion planning anywhere, you have to make sure that Jacobin inverse exists, which means you have to make sure you are not going through a singularity. Because you know if you are going through a singularity in your motion profile, even for a brief moment of time, Jacobin inverse will be some number divided by zero. So you get a divide by zero error in your computation, in your algorithm. So it will abort. Right? You are running the program and all of a sudden there's a runtime error, divide by zero. That's the end of the process. Now, Look at your look at the human body, right? Your arms and legs, you can fully stretch, and there's no problem. We are, we are not going to lock in any position, right? You can move like that. So all what I can say about that is that uh, human functionality, human brain and all that, does not use Jacobin inverse. Right? So if the if the brain uses inverse Jacobian, right, it would stuck at this position won't be able to execute the feedback control system, right? So I don't think human brain and human body uses any Jacobin inverses, therefore. So now let's move forward. In, in robotics field, we use Jacobin inverse to calculate required joint angles, angle speeds for a certain end effector motion. This is pretty much a very commonplace uh, requirement in industry. For example, welding. You want to move the end effector from point A to point B in Cartesian space along a certain direction and speed. So this is basically Cartesian space, uh, speed, x dot, y dot, z dot. And you know that. You planned your motion right in Cartesian space. And using that, you can transform that into joint speed and calculate what is the speed of joint one, joint two, joint three. And as time changes, these numbers also change, joint velocity. So you generate the joint velocity profile, okay? And you need to use this equation for that Jacobin inverse. So that is why it's very important that you are not going through a singularity. Right, now let me show you this diagram here of a control system, very old control system proposed by uh, Daniel uh, Whitney in 1969, as old as that, right? Uh, but it's very simple. If you look at the, look at here, uh, XD is the desired position. Okay, you want to, the robot to move in to that XYZ position, desired Cartesian position. And from the, um, uh, say camera system located around the robot, you can calculate your actual position and you feed it back over here, let's say. And there's a difference. The reference position, actual position, there's a difference. And you calculate it as dx. dx, delta x, very small error, okay? And um, then you have Jacobin inverse, right? As you can see in this equation, right? Uh, x dot is delta x, we appro approximate dx to x dot. And you have to multiply with the Jacobin inverse. So you need to know, you read all the joint angles, right? The configuration is known and you have the Jacobian. You work it out and then invert it, Jacobin inverse. The moment you calculate x dx with the Jacobin inverse, you get uh, t theta or dq. Okay, small joint angle deflection. So how much joint one has to move, how much joint, joint two has to move, like, and so on. And then you send this deflection to the controller to implement that. The controller develop a torque for each and every motor, positive torque if the Q is positive, negative torque if the Q is negative. And as a result of that, the robot end defector changes a little bit, X dot, sorry, XT, will be moved more towards xd to reference point. Okay, so gradually dx will be zero. dx will start from some value and eventually it goes to zero as this loop continues. Right, 
So this is a very famous uh, control system in robotics. Now we, there are more sophisticated control systems, but this is one of the classics. Any questions about that? Right. Let's talk about the motion near a singularity. Right. This is part of your second assignment. I'm trying to help you out. You can see this manipulator, right? A tooling arm, right? Uh, when it is at point A, point A is far right at this point here, right? Uh, and then uh, uh, you actuate the joint so that it moves like that along the x-axis to point B. So the end point starts from A and then move to B. And there's a little arc here to point C and then straight up to point D, right? This is the, the motion. This is one motion, right? It goes through x-axis and then little curve, jump over to the y-axis and straight up. Now look at uh, uh, the middle two configurations. When the end effector is at point B over here, this is the arm configuration. It's, it's vertically up like that. After a little while, when the end effector moves from B to C, it's a very small deflection. Okay, But uh, when the end effector is at point C, look at the arm configuration. It's more like horizontal. Now see, this vertical position has turned completely by right? almost 90 degrees, right? just to make sure that B moves from B to C. So it's a huge amount of work, motion, for one of the joints here, and very small motion for the end effect. So this is the symptom. It, it, it hints you that you are near a singularity. Of course, we're fully flexed arm is a, is a singularity, and so is the fully stretched arm. So here you your start point A and your end point D and also B and C, they are all singularities. You are very near or within the close vicinity of a singularity. Okay, right. So uh, let's try to find out some behaviors in, in motion, right, uh, around these singularities. So we have our inverse differential kinematics here. The joint angles theta 1, theta 2 dot is equal to Jacobin inverse x dot y dot. All right. So this is x dot y dot. Uh, sorry, this is Jacobin inverse. Uh, then times x dot y dot. Right, you can get this one and work it out. You get, you'll get this node just follow through right and you have these two equations so what are they you can calculate the joint one speed and joint two speed right using these two equations once you know x dot and y dot once you know x dot and y dot if you go back here x dot and y dot so while you are traveling from a to b along this line x dot has some value, y dot is zero, right? And uh, when you move from C to D, it's vertical motion, y dot is positive and x dot is zero, right? So at any point you can calculate theta one dot and theta two dot and draw the graph, right? If you do that, this is the graph you get. theta 1 dot and theta 2 dot. Look at the graphs. This is point A, point B, point C, point D. And uh, this graph is for 
theta one dot and this is for theta two dot. Look at that point A. So when you have fully stretched uh, arm, point A, right? Look at the speed of joint one. Theta one dot is very high. Theta one is very high. Theta two is also very high. This is zero, this is negative. So both of these joints, one is moving very high speed, the other one is moving also very high speed, but different direction. Different direction. So they are actually consuming a lot of energy one is trying to pull it this way, the other one is trying to pull it that way, and they compete each other. Nothing happens because of just the internal fighting. Net output is nearly zero. So that is the case for the manipulator in this configuration. If you want to move it along this line, first joint has to move positively, second joint has to move negatively. Okay? So to compensate any motion vertically upward or vertically downward and to make sure that it is only going horizontal. This is just the internal fighting between the two joints. So you can see over here, very big value positive for joint one and very big negative value for joint two, right? and very small value speed on x-axis. But it will change quickly. It's only for a moment and after that, you somewhere over here, you get positive negative speeds, but manageable. However, around the origin B to C, you can see huge velocity change in joint one, right? Just to bring the end effector from B to C, Joint one has to kill itself. Joint one has to move quite a lot, speeding up quite dangerously. For what? Just to move the end effector from B to C. So after that, you know, going vertically upward, uh, the joint one moves negative speed, joint two moves with positive speed. So this is the problem with the singularity. Over here at point A, over here at point D, and also from between B and C, they're all singular configurations. You will see very high joint speeds, very high joint speeds. Of course, these speeds are not uh, realistic, so joints will saturate. Joints will saturate, not, not being able to go beyond that level. All right. So these are the issues with the, uh, when you want to drive your manipulator, right, uh, through singular configurations. So here we have put the two mani uh, manipulator on left-hand side and velocities on the right-hand side with uh, the labels of the points A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, and D. Right. Uh, so I think it's time uh, to wind up for the day.